it's really interesting anyways to see perhaps two different ways of how education can function you know education as sort of like pedagogy and sort of education of like in practice in action and I know we have so many questions for the both of you actually but if I can just start off Dr. Kamna can I ask you a question that was really gracious um a lovely question from Tanya Radswa of Decolonized Architecture from the University of Bath and I want to direct this at you because I think this might be kind of in your realm of um, specialty. Um, so if I can ask her question is, often activists and academics take the dismantle and rebuild approach to decolonization. How can this be applied practically within higher education institutions that need to continuously maintain a structure in order to educate students? It sounds like an essay question. I feel like I should be writing 3,000 words in the topic. Um, it's a great question. Thank you to the person that submitted it. Um, so the key, the key point of the question was to dismantle, dismantle uh, the structures of education. I think it was, um, it was a, a question of parts. So it was saying like, how can decolonization be applied practically? And I think in the case of your, the way that you guys have done it at Bartlett, it's really interesting because you, would you say that there was any sort of disruption of structure in that, in the way that you approached it? Yeah, so I would say, and, and this is me speaking a little bit more broadly than the race and space mm. curriculum, it's speaking with my vice dean EDI hat on, if you like. Uh, there are multiple levers in any institution that folks in positions like mine can pull to change and affect some of the structures, and any one of them is never going to do it. It's got to be pulling all of them at the same time. So the race and space curriculum was an engagement with pedagogy, it was engagement with curriculum content. Simultaneously, there's also a, a recruitment um, focus that we're running on race and spatial justice, which means we're trying to bring in scholarship that specifically foregrounds race and spatial justice as a way to grow that work within um, the, not just the educational offering that we, that we provide, but also in the research that we do across the faculty. It also comes in with the Bartlett Promise. It's going to sound like a big plug, I'm sorry, but th this is an illustration of the levers that we're pulling, which is a scholarship scheme for undergraduates, postgraduate research and postgraduate taught. So that's all the way from an 18 year old potentially through to their PhD. And these are fully funded scholarships for under groups underrepresented in the built environment, including disabled and BAME students. So it's pulling all of these levers to try to affect the structure of education. And it's only, I think, by achieving some kind of critical mass, almost, of folks who are orientated to think about racial spatial justice, that we can take bigger bites and greater punches. So I'm heartened, for example, by conversations at Georgetown University in the United States that is looking at reparations from the sales of slaves that Georgetown University held about 100 or so years ago, 150 years ago. That is possible because of decades of anti-racism work that has been going on in that university. I would love for us to achieve a point where we can start to have conversations about reparations. I don't think we're there yet, but we're getting there. Oh, that's really promising to hear, actually. Um, thank you for that. Um, and I think that's a lot, that's a really interesting conversation that sort of like acknowledging that where we are in current position and being quite realistic really about what we can achieve, perhaps is one of those first steps you want to take as an institution of sorts, because institutions are typically slower moving, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, I, I take point, um, Ola's put in the chat, Glasgow University, they, Glasgow has, has been going through a really incredible piece of reflection on their legacies of slavery and their connections to the slave trade and are investing, putting their money where their mouth is and investing in scholarships and postdoctoral research funding for, in partnership with the University of West Indies to, to change. And um, like I said in my presentation, that decolonization as an abstract doesn't work for me. It's got to be specific. So in the case of um, Glasgow and in the case of UCL, it's specific in that we are also engaging with the legacies of eugenics and having eugenicists at the institution in the form of um, Galton and Carl Pearson. So 
So it comes from somewhere, it means something to that institution. So the person who's asking this, I think they're at Bath, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Bath. So what are, the, what are the legacies of Bath and its neighbouring Bristol, which Bath benefited from hugely in its history and its development? What are those legacies and how is efforts to decolonize Bath engaging directly with the legacies of slavery and the legacies of colonialism more generally in Bath? Have I answered the question, Carl? I, I, you've, you've gone above and beyond, Dr. Cumber. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I noticed a lot of activities, a flurry of activity happening in the chat. Um, if anybody wants to highlight, spotlight, um, uh, raise their hand, and Rosie will spotlight you and you can ask your question. And while we're waiting, you know, we, we, I, I, I think on reflection, um, doing this project, you know, the, the design think tank project is, is it has not been easy um, because purely just it is quite a, is a very, very difficult topic that, um, and also within the context within an architectural school, I mean, how do you even start thinking about architectural intervention in, in the traditional architectural sense um, to try to talk about this, to talk about this topic? And even within, because we have uh, we have three symposiums that we actually talked about, you know, even during those those three symposiums that, that we actually did encounter, you know, that even during what we call the crits, you know, that we, we still have very very heated debate, you know, even amongst ourselves. So I think we are kind of asking the difficult question, but uh, I think by what I'm trying to say is, you know, we, we can only actually go forward by sometimes actually asking these difficult questions and often almost kind of go through the struggle in order to actually try to do the research and start to, you know, doing projects, you know, like this to really asking that question. Mm. That's a good point. Um, we have a question actually from Samita. So um, Samita, if you could unmute yourself and ask a question, please. Hi there. I don't know if hi. you can see me. Oh, hi there. Thank you so much. That was really inspiring presentation so far. It's just lovely being here. Um, I was wanting, you know, the students have done this really excellent work, you know, coming up with ideas, working together, uh, despite the pandemic. And you've shown that things can be done working together. But we have very powerful structures um, political structures, social structures that try and separate us and prevent us from working together. So there is this classification of BAME and, you know, all the sort of color based classification. We have, um, you know, the recent census, you know, again, you know, we have all these things that try and separate us, tell us we're different. And what we're actually trying to say is we're the same as other people. We go through the same uh, issues as other people. And yet, you know, we are uh, put away. This is a special thing. Um, so I just want to know what, what kind of uh, solutions would you come up to say, you know, we can work together and this is what we can achieve. This is amazing. You know, all the work that you produced in Hackney. Why can't we do it all over London, all over the country, all over the world? I saw Ming. Do you? you no, no. I, 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 I might just want to say. Well, I, I think, I think there's a conversation that 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 uh, that, that they already started, uh, and in a way, we have. Um, I don't want to steal your thunder, but you know, we did actually have some sort of conversation, you know, through DSDHA, you know, with other local authority. You know, we we did actually have a have a have a um, have a chat with the GLA, but also with, with, with Croydon as well. So Ister and, and Aaron, you might want to talk about a little bit more. So, you know, I don't, I don't want to, you, you will know more about the detail. Yeah, I think as much as our project was rooted in Hackney, um, as per our brief, um, uh, at the end of our report, we, I, we drew a diagram highlighting the possibility and the desire to replicate that across, as much as obviously the context and the different um, the different groups that would not need to be adapted depending on where you are. But that was definitely a discussion that we've had and we've been lucky throughout the process to engage with a variety of actors. So people from, from Hackney, but also um, as Ming was saying, we talked with the GLA and also Croydon Council who were really uh, supportive and keen um, about the project. So that's definitely something that we'd love to expand for sure. Uh, 
that's pretty good. Um, we've actually got a question from Dagmar in relation to hacking Hackney. So Dagmar, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you everyone for your um, great presentations. Um, yeah, I think from hacking Hackney, I think it's really interesting to me. Um, I'm, I'm sitting in Lambeth um, in an area um, that has an extremely active transition town chapter. And I think when I looked at the work you were doing, I was thinking, you know, to me, because transition town purports to be very eco and, and but when I look at, at the group that's active in our area, it's incredibly, um, you know, a stereotypical upper middle class, very wide. And um, I'd be very interested to actually see how you know transition town can be hacked or lambeth can be hacked or you know because there is this this rich community and that and and i see particularly in the in the pandemic there's so many of these community groups springing up in a particular demographic that i feel could do with a bit of you know shaking and waking up um so that's one thing and the other thing is um you know working as an associate in a large practice, what I can say is that, that as Sumita said, there are so many barriers in our way, uh, you know, much um, as I would like to work more along the decolonization agenda, I'm sort of bound by the clients I'm working for and the whole framework I'm sitting within. I mean, for me, having events like these is great because for me, there's a great learning experience and a great, you know, exposing myself to things that uh, may sometimes be uncomfortable to myself. But I think there's so many more people who need to expose to these sort of things. And I'm just wondering how, you know, what, what other platforms can be invaded to just sort of, you know, put this in front of people because it's, it's, it's been around for too long. Thank you. That's really nice. Thank you so much for that, Dagmar. Um, I think it's it's a it's a really good observation. I think in general, I think um, there is always this sort of like um, present this understanding that there is perhaps a bit of a discord between what can happen in you know academia. Maybe it's a bit freer than you know the frameworks that happen um, in the real world, so to speak. Um, but what 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 do you uh, what do you have to say? I guess maybe um, Ming, I'll direct this at you actually. Um, from your experience as architect, urban planner, urban designer, and so on, what do you think? How do you think frameworks can kind of meet in the middle with what goes on in academic space? Um, well, I mean, as well as actually being sort of being in architecture school, you're being brave to actually do these these kind of talking about an uncomfortable topic but I think at the same time that um, in, in terms of you know what you call what 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 to me anyway is that part of part of these part of the issues is about what what you call decolonization or whatever sometimes we, we actually say we got to have you know from from your graph we got to have more students from a diverse background and entering into into architecture you know which is true you know you can do so much you can you should encourage that and, and it is kind of happening but but for me, or in terms of my experience, is that is is there's no representation at the top, and there is literally just seems to be very very little, uh, very very little um, movement uh, around around this topic, and and um, and I almost you know get to the point is whenever this this has been highlighted by the AJ or BD or whatever in the architectural press, and you can just see that that. Um, Quite a lot of the practices, they will always actually put out a statement to say we are very inclusive. We want a diverse, uh, we want a diverse uh, leadership, and then, but, but you only have to. It's almost laughable. You only have to go to their. You only have to go to their website. You know, most of these architectural practices, they're extremely comfortable, almost kind of parading. You know, their, their, their leadership, and you just only have to see who is actually at the top, and who is actually at the bottom. And when they actually really mean by that, they say, oh, we are really diverse is they will have lots and lots of part ones or part twos, you know, which is actually diverse, but nobody will actually make it at the top. So when you actually want to want to actually encourage this imbalance or actually try to encourage a kid uh, from from, let's say, from a, a disadvantaged background, 
they, they only just need to look and they say, well, will I be able to actually make it to the top? They, they will always actually look, you know, we, we all know that. And they will just say, well, why would I actually want to be studying architecture and actually make a difference in there? When I know that um, despite going through seven years, I will never actually make it to the top. And I think that is the main issue, you know, for me. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. And I think um, this goes especially, you know, not just to uh, minorities, you know, Asian, Black, Latino, uh, but women as well. I think, you know, women at the top, you know, is something that we've um, we, we know is a problem and we are trying, you know, to, you know, what what needs to change framework wise. I think that's that's a good, really good point. I mean, um, we've got a question actually coming in from Vinesh. Vinesh, if we could ask you to unmute yourself, please. Hi, Carl. Um, what did I forgot what I asked in the chat? <laughs> Lots of questions. That's all right. I mean, share with the group anyway, so I think it's a good one. I'm trying to remember what I asked. <laughs> oh, yes, I remember. Um, I think the, the Hackney project is absolutely amazing. Um, when I first saw it, I was so inspired by it. and it lifted my mood up and I think what would be I think institutions schools of architecture need to embrace what you've what the LSA have done what you've both done because that project is hacking it's challenging the status quo and I think we need more it's not a question what a statement really um, but we need more schools to actually do more of what you're doing I know some schools are doing it anyway but if we can start to break away from the standard projects that appear maybe up in first year, second year, and third year, maybe masters, and we can start to challenge that from early on. I think that's the, that's one way we can actually start to decolonize architecture education and start to move towards something that's more relatable to society rather than just having some vanity projects on undergraduate. I'm not saying you don't do those. You need you need a space for for everything, but if we really want to tackle some of the issues that Andeep and Asir and Minga, you've touched upon um we do need to start from from grass, grassroots i'm i'm incredibly inspired by um the presentations and also Kamla patel dr Kamla patel the, the research that you've done as well i think it's great to see schools and institutions stepping up we need to now relay that as as dagma said to the other schools across the country um because the LSA and the UCL have a strong presence in architecture education anyway. It's some of the schools outside of London, perhaps, where we need to start to try and instigate some of this, this, this change. Um, and uh, there are some educators here today, which I'm sure we'll hear from later on, and hopefully they can come up with some suggestions in terms of how we can really tackle this. That's, that's a really good comment. Thanks, Vinesh. That has lifted my spirit as well. Um, Actually, I've got a question coming in from Shumi towards Kamna. Um, Shumi, would you like to unmute yourself, please? I mean, there are questions that you may or may not feel comfortable to answer just now, um, but I think it's worth asking them anyway. Uh, not only to Kamna, and I'm, afraid, I'm sorry I'm using first names, I use everybody's first names, <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, so Kamna and Ming, both of you, I was wondering, and again, don't feel obliged to answer, but I was wondering to what extent you chose to talk about this and to raise these issues, to what extent you feel like nobody else is, I guess I should, and to what extent you're being looked to, to do it. That's a great question. And uh, I, I'm a little bit struck by the fact that people are calling me Dr. Kamla. It never happens. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just soaking it up. It's it's just camera. That's fine. And um, thank you, Shumi. Um, I, I think that you have identified a very real issue that happens to a lot of people who enter into this space. So if I tell you that my doctoral research was looking at the upgrading of informal settlements in South Africa, and I've taken a giant leap <laughs> into engaging with discussions of race and theories of race and understanding the spatial right spatial aspects of race, it comes very much uh, driven from the, if, if not me, then who, sort of school of thinking. And it comes with a hyper-visibility. 
it comes with expectations of being a figurehead and it comes with knowing that a great deal rests on doing this work. Uh, there aren't that many people who look, in fact, I don't think there's anyone that kind of looks as I do in the leadership team in my faculty. There are fewer still within my sector in development studies. It comes with an obligation, but it's an obligation that I happily bear because it's important. And I have a young child and, uh, you know, pay it forward. That's a, that's a really good point. Um, can, can, I, can I just add? Can I just add? Yeah. Can I just add? It should it, it should be and it must be Dr. Kamala Patel. <laughs> You've earned it, and it should you should never be ashamed of that. I, I just find it really, really, really annoys me, especially what you see in, in, in the mainstream media, particularly recently. What, what was it? Is um, it was uh, uh, Joe Biden's wife? You know, she is actually a doctor, and she was never being referred to as, as a doctor. So you should be. I mean. I'm not a doctor and I have no problem actually saying you should be Dr. Kamala Patel, you know. I mean, for me, you know, that's a to, to well, I mean, asking you, you're asking the question about speaking up is that it just through years of just trying, just trying to actually move up the, the career ladder and it just not happening. And, uh, and also through probably through years of actually just trying to even applying to, to kind of senior posts and, and, uh, I mean, probably, perhaps, it's just because I'm just um, not qualified enough or haven't got the experience enough. But uh, I always actually wonder: is that uh, when I'll apply to? I mean, just you know, me personally is applying to quite a lot of senior posts, and and you, I never actually get to, never get actually actually hear or actually being acknowledged to say, well, your your application is not successful. I mean, I think it happened to me once or twice that I later actually find out somebody else actually got that post, and and I looked at that person's experience and just go. Oh, okay. Well, what has he or she actually got to actually better than me? And I'm not quite sure. You know, I mean, I don't know. You know, I mean, in in a way, from for myself as a personal experience, right? You know, I study architecture. I actually qualify as an architect. I qualify as a town planner. I actually did my uh, own designer. Actually, teaching at UCL, probably one of the you know top institutions in the country. I mean, I, I don't know what else I need to do. You know, in order to actually to um to improve my experience or, or whatever but anyway so i just decided that um is time to speak up so here i am thank you both for answering and i just wanted to note that um well there are probably people in the audience who have felt similar obligations um but also just worth noting that neither of you seem to have set out to discuss these things and Perhaps on a more optimistic note, it's um, it's heartening then to see the younger generation taking these tackle uh, tackling these issues, you know, with with um, intentionality. You know, um, it's it's a difference. Much as it's painful to hear yours, it, uh, and I share part of your experience. It's interesting to see these new directions. It's amazing. It's heartwarming actually, and it makes me feel super old. I didn't think I was old, and then. <laughs> I see it and it's absolutely heartening to see what young people are producing and their thinking and it's, um, yeah, it's inspiring. Absolutely. And I think, um, I don't want to speak for young people or younger people, wherever that still is, but I think um, the younger generation is really impatient for this kind of thing to happen. And, you know, we're, that's the thing about this sort of change. The more we wait, you know, the more impatient the next generation gets and then becomes like, you know, a long time coming. And I, and I think that's, that's one of the reasons why I showed that picture of my father and myself earlier is that change has happened, but you know, at what level? And we really need to ask ourselves and identify where we can insert ourselves quickest and most efficiently to structure that change, I think. I thought it's really, I mean, I think that second session was really deep and I think we've got a lot to unpack in there. And I think there are so many key questions people will have, so I kind of, I kind of want everyone to just sort of um, sort of just reflect on that a little bit. And I think we're definitely going to get some interesting questions, but I think I wanted to, what I wanted to, I, I've got my notes in front of me. And I think something that Kinsani, that you mentioned earlier, I mean, I love 
the way you structured your presentation, actually. I, I was lapping up glitch feminism, brave spaces, ethics of care. But something I wanted to touch on that you, you very briefly um, kind of just like licked the surface of was the extra murals. And I think there was something that was said earlier. Um, that, thanks, Shimi. <laughs> Um, there was something that you said earlier, um, sorry, Amrita said earlier in the chat that I kind of want to bring back in here about EDI, um, kind of taking up this voluntary space right now. I don't know if Amrita, if you want to unmute yourself or if you're happy for me to represent you in this, um, feel free either way. But I think the idea that EDI is done very much voluntarily as sort of like a work function. Oh, Carl, hi. Um I'll just uh, I'll just say I, I think it's something that I've seen happen in practice and something that I've experienced myself um, and as a recent joiner to academia that I've started to see happen even in academia where these conversations um, happen in this secondary space um, and there's this um, I mean I think there was a conversation in the chat happening about um, feeling the pressure um, to take on those roles because you are there and available to do it and if not you then who um, but then those roles not being given um, the the financial and um, temporal support um, to actually you know be able to, to actively contribute without draining your own energy and resources in service of um, this this particular task. Um, if I may thank thank you so much for pointing that out. Um, I think that there's almost every week I see another collective sort of making this demand to be for their efforts to be recognized or else we're kind of just talking into the you know digital abyss and um, it is I think there's something interesting to be said about the very fine line you know Caroline Moser speaks about this already in the 80s um, about the how, how governments in public policy gender public policy um, thought that the at the time um, where NGOs were proliferating to put ministries of gender, you know, the, the minister of gender, you know, sort of creating a category for something that should actually be, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mode of practice, it's a, it's an, a complete um, change of ethos. And so I, I somehow find myself also navigating the tensions between that ministerialization of what's happening right now with transformative projects. And then of course, what, what, what are the terms of a working relationship that could exist? Because I don't think, I think that's, that's something quite new, like what's the contractual agreement between um, these you know, people putting in collective energy that are not privileged enough to, to sustain being in the institution? Because of course, students, and very much so, like I, I can speak from an international student perspective, have hustled 200% to be in the institution financially, and then have to make that count because they, there are no backup plans. And so to, to sort of tr tread between the spaces and set up, you know, what, what is the framework and the infrastructure of that contractual agreement that allows it to be sustainable once those very active students are gone or once those very active staff members are gone. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm very inspired by the, the work, you know, um, Race and Space um, has, has, has been a very inspiring project to me. Um, and I, I, do, I don't think that there's any solution or answer to this, but I do think that it is something that's being problematized more openly, you know, sort of naming it openly in these forums at every opportunity where, where we can. And, um, and also just having the ability to withhold and say no, because that's the only thing that we have within our control when we have to show up to these diversities, just no, pay me or no. <laughs> um, I'm not a capitalist at heart, but you know, I got to pay bills, so. <laughs> just that point. <laughs> it's about value, isn't it? Yeah. If you're going to be contributing your emotional and physical labor to increase the value of the education being given, to increase the value of the brand that's hiring you, to increase the value of whatever the fuck, then why are you not part of that value equation? Can, can I just add, just, um, I think um, I'm, I'm consistently the only person of color in most practices I work at, in most meetings I go to, I work on large scale projects and it, and 
And I think there's also something to be said about the work that is done that is is not visible is when you go into a meeting and somebody has like it happens to me every day pretty much that someone says some someone whitewashes something and they don't realize and you're the only person who sees it and I'm going to be very honest with you yesterday I was told I was looking at a report in um, the practice that um, I, I work with and they had a project near Brick Lane and they their cultural context was only um, the kind of hipster culture. They did not have one picture out of 20 pictures of any person from an ethnic minority in Brick Lane looking at a historical context. My family grew up in that area. I wanted to cry and give up architecture. But I, I mean, that that happens every other day and these are tiny things that are not in your EDI strategy that are not like visible but that are really like emotionally kind of difficult that we go through every day seeing ourselves erased um and so it's just it's, it's it, and I, I just think it's it's really important that people on an academic level also realize that that it, I love, I'm so inspired by the next generation because they are all these really, they, they do inspire me. That's why I love teaching. But this is also the reality of practice. And this is what people have to face. And there's no way of getting around that. That is also the truth. And that's why I think, Shimi, you're, you're so right. Like whatever coalition you can create is the only, sometimes the only way to survive, you know? And, and I just think it's really important that we we kind of remember that those things are out there too. Um, like that's the reality for a lot of people who are just going to go and work in practice after education um and, and, and also as educators we have to try and prepare them a bit so that's a really good point there Sana. i think um it would reason one of the reasons when we were like formulating this event and we, we we talked about this as well some of the participants like why focus on education why and i think when i sent out that brief i was very aware like oh um education is you know as the precursor to practice or sort of the, you know, providing the, um, the backdrop to practice or somewhat. But, you know, as Dagma, I believe in the chat has really um, well said earlier as well, she said that, you know, what, where, what about secondary education? What about education in an earlier stage? But also you bring in this very valuable perspective of practice of what's happening, you know, when you're raised in practice and, you know, how do you go about that kind of situation? You know, like, is there a need for, is it a, is it not just one need? Is it a need for multiple sources of education? Not, not just at university, but before university, after university, can we bring that into practices somehow? Is there a, 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 an opportunity, you know, can we make a CPD about decolonization? Is that, I think is that what's what I think is, I think yeah. the students should come in and give practices CPDs. <laughs> about like contemporary issues because academia is generally ahead of practice in a lot of the real issues of the real world that we should actually be putting back in so you know I'm working on a social value report there's all these students looking at that you know they're miles ahead of what's really happening so I feel like it, th that discourse kind of needs to take on a new shape and form that that's my my thought but anyone else have any ideas but <laughs> and perhaps to bring back to Amrita's um, point is that these students should be paid to go and present it to practices really? and it'd be fair <laughs> I think so I think that's a great idea um, I I, I'm, I'm all for people doing a bit of their own work though too um kind of no one's going to do any work. Yeah, the, the, the drafting in of people um, is just like 2% of what you could be doing, right? Even if it is paid. And yes, students could go and tell other people how to do things better. And yes, that would have cumulative good impact, I'm sure. But also, why should they? They need to be starting their own careers. Why should they be like having to spend time saying, don't be stupid, you know? like. I, I, I'm not at all denying that it would be a great thing. It's just that what are we creating where that's what has to happen? I don't think it's just about this topic. I think it's about a lot of contemporary issues. So looking at things, issues around technology, how do you progress that? Looking at localities, climate. Like I, I think it's looking at colonization on a broader um, kind of perspective as well. Um, and, I, and I just think that students um, have space to investigate and look at that with a very open 
I and people in practice don't. And then it also creates networks for the future because both kind of forums have an opportunity to learn from each other. But I, I totally get what you're saying. Why should we be talking about like, you know, how we've been oppressed and, you know, it's, I get that aspect too. If I, if I may add on to that last line is that I think there's also something that, that struck out to me earlier in um, the symposium. I think it's a, a question that um, Shumi um, posed earlier um, and that was centered around like who obligation and um, you know the work being put on the shoulders of the oppressed and then who who's listening um, I think that that's the interesting some, somehow in um, at least in, in from my perspective safe spaces are so important for for sustaining oneself <laughs> emotionally in the world and then the sort of braver spaces to, as Ananya Roy put it in a recent lecture that she gave at GSD on the abolition of property, um, to name these things openly. But of course, the protections around that are so are so difficult. When we, when we, for instance, gave this talk at the ETH, so many um, academics mentioned that they were, um, of course, within their context. Um, afraid to speak up about certain things because they could be very easily replaced. And so what does it mean to form, as you say, that the need that the only, actually the only way to survive is through coalition um, in that sense, like who takes on the risk at what point um, so that we can just openly name things and find a way of sharing so that we're not carrying this initiative as, you know, the oppressed, but it's just, I, I, I'm, I'm very inspired by um, the, the, the emphasis on coalition um, that, that you brought up, Shumi. Thank you. It wasn't scholarly. It's just from my like <laughs> from my stomach. I'm sure there are, <laughs> and I'm I'm more than capable of coming up with you know a scholarly paper on it. I just didn't want to. Um, that's all. We've had plenty of that, but I think that's you know that's a really good point. That um, we've got a question from Tanya. Uh, who is actually our mystery questioner earlier from our decolonized architecture bar? Tanya, are you around? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Hi. <laughs> hey, hello. Um, yeah, so I think um, referring to my earlier question, um, it was just, I guess, a case of you know learning more about um, knowledge production, and I guess that linked to also what happens afterwards in terms of the distribution. And how can we kind of acknowledge the intersectionality of race with other identities? And if we're going to take a decolonial approach to it, how can we also make it fully accessible? So um, I guess it was just me thinking about um, uh, kind of how can we actually relay this to people who might be less academic and kind of spread the movement in that way and kind of yeah reach people in that aspect if we're going to kind of taken out of the privileged circles of universities. How can we do that? That's a really good point, Tanya. Um, does anybody want to chip in? I can say something. <laughs> um, collectivize, collectivize. I know I seem like I'm pushing the collectivized agenda, but but really I think it's it's been, um, I completely agree with your points on accessibility and this language that we're also conditioned to get so comfortable in. And then um, very surprisingly um, confronted with, particularly when doing work in, in practice or doing work that, that concerns field work. Um, I faced this myself when, um, you know, simply as a South African stepping outside of South Africa to do something inside of South Africa with, with people who are very um, open, open and, and also open to calling out. And it's what an unlearning and incredible learning process it is to to um yeah to to somehow um purposely put oneself outside of um the academic space because it, i think it, it it happens sort of subconsciously and it's continuing so i suppose this is not necessarily addressing at a um a systemic level but um more in terms of what the happenings in 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 class really trying to form collaborations with organizations, collectives, practices, I mean, Alice is doing it, um, with, with people who, who will be able to bring in voices that teach us to speak 
and um, understand things in, 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 in other, language, other languages, right? Mm. No, that's a really good point. Um, I, 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 sorry. Sorry. I think it exists. It's just a, a matter mm. of, of joining forces. Definitely, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's, um, it's a really good point as well. And then like, I've always said that architecture education could start earlier. It could start in schools because I came into architecture with a very difficult set of A-levels, basically without art or history or anything. Um, I was pure science and I felt that I lacked a lot of the architecture language. And I think, you know, feeling from my own experience, like I think, you know, design, space, spatial design should be taught at an earlier age. Spatial design should be taught to everyone. It shouldn't be a luxury. Really, it should be something that we can disseminate. And I don't know if there's any space with these structures um, uh, of you know coalition and collectivism, um, how we can use that. You know, I know um like Black Fam Art, for example, does a lot of really good outreach programs to um uh, various institutions. I wonder if there's a way we can get more sorts of like collectives into schools, perhaps, or um other spaces that are not even educational spaces perhaps you know are there you know if, if you're taking like um if you're taking spaces outside of you know our, what we're used to over here you know maybe the community centers you know maybe the gurdwara maybe the temples maybe i don't know is there space for that kind of thing um <laughs> that's an open the, question the question <laughs> is like how how do you take which discussion where sorry because i mean in terms yeah. of decolonizing high school curricula mm. or even junior school curricula that's happening slowly by slowly it's mm. happening mm -hmm. partly because of media exposure of gross racism and um just awful <laughs> cultures in school so that is happening and i i, mm. I wonder if we're I mean, certainly I'm not equipped to speak to that too much other than that I'm reading headlines to say that it's being, it, people are going, okay, now we better change that you know, now. So I guess I'm kind of, I just wanted clarification on the question and perhaps that involves me also thinking, well, what is my sort of purview? Where, how can I operate? This is another thing that I find with my architecture students often want to change the world and it's okay. And, and that's great. <laughs> I went, to do that too but um just trying to understand where it is that we operate and in what so so i don't know if it's tanya's question now or carl's but like which thing are we trying to communicate to him now um I, I'll, I'll let tanya ship in but mine was kind of dedicated towards um architecture design education but tanya was i did i deviate from your sets of uh no no you expanded <laughs> um <laughs> i guess yeah in terms of modes of Communication as I was sort of thinking, um, like if we're gonna also consider how anti-racism can intersect with anti-ableism, um, like what are we providing when we record lectures, um, things like that, and most of communication, is it just speech? Because you know, there are many architecture students who um may use other modes of communication. So yeah, it was just uh, my thoughts, really, I guess, listening to the presentation. We had, we had a deaf student, um, he, at CSM last year, he, like, won the award, um, you know. Amazing. We, yeah, like, <laughs> he had a, had a um, sign interpreter with him, and we did everything over Zoom, so, I mean, I think that there are, I think, I think different, at the end of the day, there are lots of different issues around inaccessibility depending on what the issue is and we do need to deal with them in like and like individually as to what those issues are um you know that's what equity is right um being able to give people the same opportunities but according to what their kind of concern is especially when it comes to dis disabilities but um i think that, that there are there are lots of different kinds of issues around um, around all these topics you know like I know I've been I've been an examiner when I've had um you know uh, we examined as a pair and someone um gave gave a presentation on um she's a, a girl from Cornwall and she her her project was about Saudi women and doing a project in Jeddah and then I had to give feedback because obviously the guy from Oxford has no idea but I should so it's all on me so then what what does that say about, and I don't even know why I should but you know then there's, there's an issue around whose responsibility is that and you know like how are we <laughs> yeah I mean it's, it's kind of 
things fall on different people but how do we kind of address these issues um and and talk about it and say okay well i felt like this in this space because uh, often people don't even know so a lot of it is like discussions like this and um and trying to make sure we have space to to express things and feel comfortable to do so um so i think 100 percent, that's what we need and i think i'm I'm purely speaking from my own experience here, but it's very difficult to advocate for that. Certainly very difficult to advocate for that in tiny little packets. So um, again, another useful reason for banding together and saying, no, I think we need to have space to talk about this or to be trying to talk about that. Because I think if people are speaking from their own difficulties, oftentimes, you know, little voices are easier to ignore. Um, but I think something else that I think ought to be, I mean, I'm into recognizing responsibility. Can you tell that I've been in like therapy for a few years as well? So, um, so I think talking to my students about, let's just think about the fact that you've decided to come to university, the fact that somewhere at some point, something in you or around you suggested that this will put you in a better, better position than the next person and that that is a specific mode of value that you are choosing to put yourself through and, and so on and, and can we just acknowledge that it is but one way of getting ahead in life and for whatever reason you've decided to put yourself in this way which has its strictures it has its constraints it has its violences it certainly has its exclusions that's why you're in it so that you're a bit ahead of somebody else right so i think um Again, I guess I'm kind of reflecting a lot of the work I'm trying to do my, in myself and by extension that I'm getting my students to do in themselves too. Um, in, terms of, in terms of asking for things to be recognized, I have to think about my expectations and think carefully about where I'm placing them. Am I placing them on my colleagues? Is that fair? Am I placing them on my students? Is that fair? Am I placing them on the institution? Does it recognize them? Um, if it doesn't, what do I do about that? Who can I turn to? These kind of quite operational questions are how I'm trying to sort of unpick these questions of access. Because I don't, I think as Sana, I don't, none of us know how or when to fix anything. But um, it's just trying to appreciate how much we can expect and where from and really trying to think hard about that. What is it that's going to motivate somebody to do something? How can I build that? Thanks, that's, a really, sorry. that's a really good point there. And I think I just want to make a quick note here that we've officially gone into overtime and that we're officially over. So if anybody feels a need to drop off, because I know it's been a long day, but do, do not feel a need to stay behind at all. We, this is all optional now, but we will stay back here. And um, I think all, um, anybody who's still around, we're happy to sort of like carry on this conversation if you feel like it. I mean, uh, um, Shumi, Sana, Kansani, I, I, I don't know if you guys need to run off to anything else, but um, if you guys are okay, we'll... All right, for a bit. I'm okay. Yeah. I can probably stay for 20 more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm going to run straight. I'm not going to waste time. I'm going to run straight into a question. We have a question from Lucia, actually. Um, Lucia, can you unmute yourself, please? Yes, yes. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, and I'm going to try to pose this question. I don't know if it's a slightly off topic, but um, I think maybe it ties in with what Shimi was saying about taking our responsibility and recognising who, um, yeah, recognising our own role. And I suppose as someone who's about to finish their part two and soon going to hopefully become a designer and going to put buildings into the world. I'm wondering, enticing a little bit with what Dr. Kamana Patel was talking about earlier, about colouring a space and how there's, um, well, I suppose, how, how we build effects and how people feel they can relate to a space. Um, I'm wondering how it's, uh, and maybe this is a very personal question as a person who's um, been raised from white heritage how as a designer we can respond to to the idea of coloring space without falling into cultural appropriation how we can sort of 
how um, yeah how we can find a, a design language that um, that is inclusive to others without actually taking the language from other cultures, if that makes any sense. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. Sam, do you want to take that? Yeah, answer that? It was kind of something I was trying to touch upon at the end of what I was saying about the questions you're asking. Um, and I think it's it's often, um, I've worked, I mean, I've worked in practice for like 15 years or something and, you know, designed various kinds of buildings. And, and it's only at the end you kind of often realise these things that, okay, that that that's actually referencing this. But but ultimately, I just, I think it's making sure you have a design team um, that, that represents lots of different groups of people from different backgrounds. That is actually the most powerful thing. And then secondly, um, you know, I think... Um, yeah, I, think, I mean, I, I really think, and then secondly, asking the other questions, the questions that are not what we necessarily ask in architecture school, which are generally about visual and how things look, but actually asking, um, you know, about the economics, about the politics, about the social fabric. I mean, I'm consistently in design reviews where architects are always just talking about fenestrations and forms um, and relating that to con the contextual vernacular. And you're like, what about how people express themselves? What about like how people hang out in a space? And often these are things that are not properly discussed. Um, so it, it's going back to kind of the questions I was posing, which is like, what does that mean socially? Who, who's being pushed out? Who, who is like, ask, I think asking those questions at an early stage. And, and I, as I'm aware that if you go into practice now, you know, you, you may, you know, it, it's hard to ask those questions. But you know, it's, it's it's not something that hopefully people should shy away from. So you know, feel confident to ask some because it's coming from a genuine place, I guess. <laughs> Definitely, Sana, and I think that's a great note to end on. I think less apologies for ourselves, less apologies for where we come from, and less apologies just for being who we are, really. And coalition, 